Hello, friends and neighbors. Uh, this is John Farrell. I am the author of this report on Community Choice Energy, the presenter today, uh, and also uh, going to get things started here in just a minute. I like to give people a couple minutes because if you're like me, you show up to webinars a little bit fashionably late, and I get going fast once I get going. So I'm going to give it like 30 more seconds. Um, a couple logistics. There are um, three periods when we're going to have some polls. Uh, where I'm going to ask some questions, so be prepared to click and answer uh, when we get to those points. Um, we're going to use the questions part of the control panel for you to submit questions as we go so that I can catch them at the end, um, but we'll hopefully, depending on the size of the audience, be able to also let people talk out loud as well. We'll see uh, kind of where we're at when we get to the end of the hour. Um, yeah, presumably you've been on a webinar before. It's here. Maybe you'll open another tab, check the news, check Twitter while you're doing it. You could live tweet this if you want. We'd love it. Um, use some sort of awesome tag if you decide to do that. Uh, and we'll follow along afterwards. But uh, anyway, thank you everyone for joining us. And uh, I think I'm gonna go ahead and get started in about 20 seconds. So we get about 20 seconds of silence or of the sound of me breathing and moving around in my office and then we'll get going. Thanks so much. All right, um, well, I'm gonna go ahead and get started with this presentation about uh, this new report from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance called Community Choice Energy, an alternative to electricity monopolies that enables communities to center people and the planet. Um, I will be looking at the chat box and the question box as we go, so you can throw questions in there, throw something in the chat if we're having issues with audio or video, but uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get rolling. So if you can't see the presentation right now, please let me know, because I'll be, uh, um, it's always helpful to have some verification that what I am seeing here is what you are also seeing. Uh, we're going to get started. So I'm going to start off with a little story here uh, about a giant slayer. Uh, this is Dawn. Um, oh, she's the executive director at Marin Clean Energy. Uh, and I've never seen her carry this particular weapon, but think it would suit her very well. And um, to me, her story is kind of the really important one behind how Community Choice Energy really got started in a meaningful way on on this track of uh, clean energy and in a way that is really fundamentally changing how communities can have more control over their energy system. And uh, so she, the reason that she had to be a fighter and the reason that she had to battle uh, over community choice energy was that it, she was behind along with many other folks, uh, the startup of Marin Clean Energy, which was the first community choice program that successfully launched in California. And it took an enormous effort in order uh, to be uh, successful with that. Oh, just had a question if my screen was actually shared with everybody. I'm checking sharing. It says waiting to view my screen. That's disturbing. How do I share my screen? Thank you folks for your comments telling me that I need to figure out how to share my screen. Awkward beginnings. Look at that. All right, we've got a screen. We've got a webinar. Can folks now see the slides? It tells me that I am sharing slides now, which is very exciting. Excellent, I see a yay and a yes. So thanks Aiden <laughs> for confirming that we're live. All right, so uh, you're looking at a picture of Dawn. Uh, we, she's the executive director at Marin Clean Energy. And as I was saying, this is the first uh, community choice program to launch in California. And the reason that she had to be a fighter was because it was a major uphill battle in order to be successful. Um, 
as she says in the podcast interview that I did with her a number of years ago, uh, Pacific Gas and Electric and other investor-owned utilities put up an army of lawyers to oppose them in launching their community choice program. It took um, nearly a decade. Uh, the law was initially passed in 2002 uh, to allow communities to aggregate their uh, residential and small commercial customers. And it wasn't until 2010 that Marin Clean Energy was uh, finally able to launch. So the army of lawyers was one thing they had to contend with. Uh, and also a whole lot of uh, utility money uh, that was thrown out in, uh, or uh, that uh, the investor-owned utilities used to oppose the launch of community choice programs. And so here's our first poll, your first chance to weigh in, which is how much money did California utilities spend to stop the first community choice program from launching? And I'm referring to the fight, oh, it was a particular proposition that was on the ballot uh, that they, they uh, were funding in order to try to stop community choice. Um, so the options here are A, 3 million, B, 9 million, C, 35 million, or D, 87 million on this proposition battle, I believe took place in 2014. Uh, and it looks like the poll is getting launched. Thank you, Jess uh, Delfiaco, communications manager with ILSR. Um, and I am going to go ahead, and it's now accepting responses. So go ahead and weigh in there. I'll wait a couple seconds. Um, it looks like folks have responded to that very well. Thanks for coming back if you've been on another tab and weighing in. Um, we'll give it a few more seconds here. I see that many of you here are familiar with the ways that investor-owned utilities are protective of their market share. We've got a lot of votes for the higher numbers. Just a couple more seconds if you wanna to try to find the poll on the control panel and vote. Excellent turnout, over 80%. Many of you probably also practicing your voting turnout on Super Tuesday. Thank you for your service of democracy. So I'll go ahead now, we'll close the poll. Um, and share the results there. It looks like the plurality here, I uh, got the right answer, which was $35 million on Proposition 16. Um, some of you thought 87 million. I, I will say the 35 million is not the only money that these utilities have spent to try to stop community choice aggregation. They have spent other money on other initiatives. And so in some ways you might be right that it was greater than 35 million, but this was on this one particular proposition uh, and was just one of the many barriers that Marin Clean Energy and other California community choice agencies faced in terms of trying to exercise their right to have more community uh, choice and power. Um, and the result, of course, is a really dramatic transformation in the operations that electric customers in California have for clean energy. So Marin Clean Energy has three different um, services that it provides, electricity mixes that customers can get. The light green is the default product, product which is 60% renewable. Uh, significantly above uh, what was offered by the inv uh, incumbent investor-owned utility, in this case, Pacific Gas and Electric at the time. Uh, they have a deep green product, which is all 100% California-produced renewable energy, and they also even have a local product, Local Soul, uh, which is 100% locally produced solar um, you purchased through their feed-in tariff program, um, which you can read about a little bit more in the report. Um, so it was really pretty transformational, and, and really it's been California community choice agencies that more than any others, uh, as we talk about in the report, in, uh, a case of California exceptionalism uh, around their ability to exercise this uh, local authority in a way that has really addressed consumers' interest in more clean energy. Um, but they've also addressed a lot of other things too, and we'll get into that. Uh, if you want to hear more about what Dawn had to say about the challenges of launching Marin Clean Energy, it was a podcast interview we published, uh, I recorded it with her now, I guess it was six years ago. Uh, it doesn't seem that long. Um, it's part of our Local Energy Rules podcast. You can look up on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or many other places, um, uh, but you can get the complete interview there. Uh, there's also some pretty good notes uh, if you go to the Institute for Local Self-Reliance webpage, click on Energy and the Local Energy Rules podcast, you can go through the list of, of podcast interviews and, and look at a summary as well. Um, so now that I've jumped into that and gotten into the story about community choice, I'll just take a quick minute to explain who I am. Uh, so I'm one of the co-directors of ILSR. Our organizational vision is to build local power to fight corporate control in the economy. I'm the director of our Energy Democracy Initiative. We do national, national research and advocacy and really work with our allies to give communities more decision-making power over their energy future. Uh, as I mentioned, I host the Local Energy Rules podcast. We have 99 episodes. Uh, our 100th episode will be coming up later this month. 
Uh, and I'm on, you can find me on Twitter. It's kind of the one social media place I hang out um, and like to talk about energy policy and, and share energy stories. Uh, and you can learn a little bit more about me in the, the, the John Farrell in a pie chart if you're interested there. Mostly policy wonk, but uh, a few other characteristics that I have as well. So uh, from there, let's talk a little bit more um, about community choice and how it is a growing choice of power, growing source of power uh, among the places that it is available and in, in, in terms of the number of states where it's available. So um, right now in the nine states uh, where it currently uh, uh, is, is available to cities, uh, to communities to select their power provider by aggregating customers, uh, it serves about 12% of electricity customers. Uh, but it's been growing very quickly in, in, in three particular states. California, where the, um, uh, there's been this uh, significant upswell, uh, there's as many 12 million more customers uh, that will be part of Community Choice Aggregation's plan to launch in the next couple of years. Um, in New York, where it's been relatively new, over 50 cities and towns have created programs, most in just the last year alone. Uh, and in Massachusetts, over 150 new Community Choice uh, uh, communities, new cities uh, have uh, uh, pursued community choice since 2015. Um, so it's definitely something that even in states like Massachusetts, where the policy has been around now for almost 30 years, uh, it's growing significantly. In states like California, New York, where it's also relatively newer, um, it's growing significantly. Um, and even in the states where it is both growing to serve more customers, it's also becoming a significantly new uh, portion of the electricity supply. Uh, chain in terms of uh, purchases for electricity. So wholesale power purchases by community choice agencies in California have been rising very quickly uh, year over year and will continue to rise as, as more communities are pursuing this method of local control over their energy system. Um, so what is community choice? I've kind of explained this. Uh, I, I'm assuming that a lot of folks who have come to this um, are already very familiar with it. Um, and uh, but I want to take just a minute to kind of give people a background and a common grounding in, in what community choice is. Uh, so this is a graphic borrowed from Sonoma Clean Power, Cal CCA, and actually a number of other folks. I've seen it all over the place. Um, that I think is really helpful in just explaining the basics, that there are sort of three parties to the delivery of electricity under community choice. The source party, the one that buys the electricity that comes to customers, is this community choice aggregation, this community choice agency which buys and builds energy supplies. They you know, contract for power from solar panels, from wind turbines, from you name it, wherever they uh, believe the best uh, supply is for their community. The delivery is done through the current utility. So in the case of Marin Clean Energy, it's Pacific Gas and Electric owns the, the wires and poles that actually deliver that electricity to customers. And they bill for that uh, and actually do, and in many cases, have the billing relationship with the customer where they uh, show both the charges for the energy that the community choice agency purchases and uh, the cost of the delivery services that the utility is providing. And then of course, there, the final element in this is the customer um, who is often saving money from lower costs from community choice purchases, often cleaner energy, and of course, the benefit of having more local decision-making power, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, this is a kind of another nice way uh, that Lean Energy US, which is a stands for the Local Energy Aggregation Network, which does national advocacy around community choice, uh, has a very helpful graphic kind of contrasting community choice aggregation with municipal public utilities, where the city actually owns the entire utility system. And you can see that if you switch from an incumbent provider to community choice, the real, the, the real significant change is around that, uh, that option to purchase the power. Um, there are some other uh, powers and roles and responsibilities that increasingly we're seeing community choice agencies take on but that's the main one. Uh, the incumbent utility maintains the transmission lines and provides the customer service interface with folks around power outages and, and delivery of, of energy services. And municipal public utilities, of course, are significantly different in that they own everything. They're as vertically integrated as the utility, um, uh, like an investor-owned utility in the sense that they purchase the power, they maintain the lines and provide uh, the customer service. Some of this can vary a little bit from state to state, then depending on whether or not you have a competitive retail market. I'm not going to get into some of those distinctions because it gets rather complicated rather quickly. Um, but the primary difference between community choice and an incumbent utility is who, who decides where the power comes from. So where do communities have choice? Unfortunately, it's not in every state uh, that communities have choice. There are nine states now uh, highlighted in the dark orange on this map. Uh, that have community choice aggregation, uh, California, Illinois, and Ohio, Virginia, 
New York, New Jersey, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. Uh, Rhode Island is a little different in the sense that they only allow aggregation for purchases for municipal uh, electricity serving municipal purposes. So the electricity that powers City Hall, for example, or a, a public library, and not for ultimate customers. All the other states uh, who have choice programs allow these aggregations to serve uh, um, ultimate customers, uh, residential and, and small commercial customers. One of the things that I wanted to put on this map that I think is really important is uh, what you see is this, uh, the outlines of community choice states overlaid on which states allow, have deregulated electricity markets and have a residential um, electricity choice for their customers. And what you'll find, of course, is that in most states, there is choice uh, individually before there is community choice. Uh, that was actually true in California. California re-regulated after the Enron debacle in 2002. Uh, that was also true of Virginia. Virginia was previously uh, deregulated at the retail level. And, and had a community choice law that has only recently been uh, changed in a way that, that programs could actually develop. And so, uh, and, and, and this makes perfect sense, of course, because when you look back at the context that I gave at the beginning about Dawn and the Marin Clean Energy, incumbent utilities in regulated markets have monopolies and community choice is a threat to their market share. It takes away market share by taking away customers to buy their power. So in states where you have already separated those functions, where you've already broken up a utility and said, you know, the, the generation of power is now separate from the delivery of power, the political opposition is much weaker to community choice and it's much easier to establish community choice programs and po uh, rather to establish community choice policies that give communities the power uh, to make that decision because you don't have that in, uh, incumbent uh, utility company uh, uh, so worried about the loss of market share. Um, so with that in mind about where community choice is available across those nine states, uh, we're back to the polls here to ask which state of those nine states has the highest share of customers enrolled in community choice programs. So I am counting on Jess there. She's got the poll set up. Thank you again, Jess, for running this side of uh, the business. But the, we're going to pick between four states, California, Illinois, Massachusetts, and Ohio which has the highest share of customers. So this is not the highest share of electricity sales in community choice, but the highest share of eligible customers. And here we go. Folks are already voting. Excellent turnout again. Thank you everybody for participating. We're over 80% already. I think it was 85% that voted the first time. I'm gonna use this as a measure of whether or not people are still paying attention as we go along here. I decided to skip though for folks who were curious watching other webinars that I've done the poll where I ask how many other tabs you have open because I'm always guilty of that. We're over 90% turnout which is great. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll so we can move on. Um, and we have a tie uh, in our vote between California and Massachusetts uh, each at 41% but the truth is actually Illinois um, has the highest share of customers that are enrolled in choice programs. Uh, 34% Massachusetts comes a close second and California is at 8% and I I want to apologize, though, to those of you who voted for California. That number is probably higher. Um, this report has taken me a lot longer to write than I would have liked, so some of the data is lagging a little bit. I am sure that California number is actually higher now, um, but we tried to use uh, numbers that were consistent uh, from the same time frame for all these things. So my apologies to you California voters. Uh, I think you're probably more right than you, than you know or than I am reflecting here, uh, but it was Illinois that actually has the highest share currently. Illinois is actually a really case, uh, interesting case study, and we could talk more about it, but, um, and there's some more coverage on it in the report in terms of the way that their program has developed, but uh, they have the highest share. And you can see here on this uh, chart and, and um, how that share plays out across all of the different states. So uh, you have Virginia, for example, doesn't have active programs. Rhode Island, as I mentioned before, uh, serves only city governments, uh, so it can only sh serve a fairly small portion uh, of total customers. Um, New Jersey and, and New York are both relatively new in terms of either their law was amended to make it easier to do choice programs in the case of New Jersey back in 2012 uh, or New York where the pilot, first pilot program actually launched just a couple of years ago uh, in Westchester County. Um, so uh, Massachusetts uh, has a much more established program. Illinois, uh, there was a, a spike in uh, power prices a number of years ago when the community choice became available and there was a stampede of 
cities uh, to sign contracts through community choice to lower costs for customers. Um, I imagine that number is actually trending downward as a number of communities have let those programs lapse no longer that those, now that those savings are no longer available. So I um, want to talk a little bit about the options that uh, Community Choice provides for customers. So you have uh, not only choices for communities in these nine states to aggregate customers to choose where their power comes from, but you actually have four different choice options for customers as well. So you have uh, one which is called Opt Up, uh, which is where customers are allowed to select more renewable energy than the default supply. So we covered Marin Clean Energy before. They have that local solar program where you can choose to get 100% of your electricity from local solar uh, as opposed to the default 60% renewable mix. And a lot of community choice agencies have this option. Um, you also have an opt-down. So for example, in the Peninsula, Peninsula Clean Energy, oh, um, uh, in the um, uh, Peninsula Clean Energy Program in California, uh, Portola Valley, one of the cities that's part of that program, did 100% renewable energy as their default supply option and allowed people then to opt down uh, to test out whether or not people, given the, uh, the option, uh, would do so. And actually, they found out the opt-down rate was less than 10% of customers, which is pretty remarkable. Um, uh, there's two other pieces that are important. So opt out is the default policy model for community choice. So it is when a community like San Diego, for example, which recently announced it's uh, pursuing a choice program, starts offering electricity service, all customers who are eligible are automatically signed up with the city of San Diego as their electricity supplier with an option to opt out of the program. And in fact, this is the only successful model that works. There are uh, policies that have previously passed that are opt-in, where the customer stays with the incumbent utility by default and they can opt into the community choice service. It doesn't work though, because the kind of overhead investment that the community has to make that they will recover from the sale of electricity to customers, uh, without that knowledge that they will have a certain customer base to work with ahead of time, um, that none, no program has ever launched for community choice based on the opt-in model. So all of the laws that we have that allow for community choice where programs have actually been launched um, use the opt-out model. So let's talk about, now that we've covered um, a little story about how community choice interfaces with incumbent utilities, the fact that it's growing and kind of exactly what it is, let's talk about why communities are interested in community choice. Why are they choosing to have a say in their energy system. And there's really three key elements. The first one is local control. Uh, the second one is to kind of avoid tensions in the business model for, in a, for example, in contrast to an investor-owned utility that has shareholders who have different financial and uh, maybe political interests in customers. Um, uh, and for example, a lot of investor-owned utilities uh, get their return on capital when they make investments in infrastructure, in capital investment. Uh, when they oppose customer ownership of things or when they uh, increase electricity sales. And all of these might be in tension in with uh, the public interest or the with uh, of the communities that they serve. Um, and then really community choice is important because, and, and you see this in the states that have adopted it in addition to individual choice, it is better than individual choice for individuals because it gives those individuals market power by allowing them to aggregate together and to go out into the market and to purchase as a larger entity together. And we'll talk a little bit about why that, uh, more about why that's important. And there's more on that in the report about the fact that most community choice agencies are able to offer lower cost power than customers can get um, from the default, from the incumbent utility, because they're able to shop around and they're able to do it at scale. So in the report, one of the things that we do when we talk about community choice, to talk about you know both why communities are doing community choice and also to talk about what it is that they're doing that's interesting is we categorized community choice programs into two buckets. One I described as sort of modest community choice programs. They, uh, and, and I'll describe them here, and, and it describes sort of, sort of the basic advantages of when you pool people together to buy energy together and have that local control. And then later I'm gonna talk about uh, this other category where we talk about ambitious community choice programs, which is really the programs that have said how do we leverage this to do as much as possible? Not just how do we get people a better deal on electricity purchases or maybe even a little bit more renewable energy, 
but how do we leverage all of the powers that come along with the decision-making control over energy supply, whether it's jobs or economic development or what have you, uh, uh, to make the most of that decision. And so we'll get to that next. So the biggest thing about uh, modest community choice programs, and I should, I should clarify, everything that I say about modest community choice programs applies to the ambitious ones as well. So it's a layered effect here. But the big thing for community choice is we're talking about buying in bulk. When we can buy more at the same time of electricity, we have buying power, we can negotiate better deals. And that's what we're seeing in communities that have choices. They're able to go out in the market and by aggregating customers, they have far more uh, opportunity to exercise choice over the energy supply than if folks were acting individually. Um, another one is that these are public agencies and so they have lower executive salaries than you see with you know, no larger investor-owned utilities. So just as an illustration, Dawn, Weiss from Marin Clean Energy has a salary about a third as much as the CEO of Pacific Gas and Electric. Uh, the Pacific Gas and Electric uh, CEO also has many other forms of both non-cash compensation and non-salary compensation, although that was probably more true before they filed for bankruptcy. Uh, so I may need to update that slide. But the, the point remains that public uh, leaders of public agencies tend to get paid less uh, than those in the private sector. Um, community choice agencies also have access to low-cost capital. Um, just like municipal utilities or municipal governments, they can access, uh, they can issue tax-free municipal bonds. Uh, those bonds are often at like a 5% interest rate compared to the weighted average cost of capital for investor-owned utilities, which can be anywhere from 10 to 15%, depending on the credit rating of the utility and its current debt load. Uh, this, these numbers in particular come from the California Energy Commission study uh, almost a decade ago that was comparing the access to cost of capital. Um, I should clarify that this so far hasn't been such a, a, a big issue because you haven't seen community choice agencies in most places actually issuing debt to build and own power generation. They've actually rather gone out and signed power purchase agreements. Um, but this is a, an advantage that I think we're gonna start seeing to take place, particularly in California, where community choice agencies really are starting to go out and procure more energy, uh, new energy that's on the grid as opposed to uh, buying from existing supply. Um, and then the final thing that we see in, in these so-called modest community choice agencies is the ability to aggregate um, uh, multiple cities. And so uh, in the same way that I was showing you that first slide about buying in bulk, it's sort of this doubling down on buying in bulk. What you see in California in particular uh, and is enabled by that state law is that you can have multiple cities be part of the same aggregation. So instead of just aggregating you know, the 15,000 people that live in Johnsonville, you can now get the 150,000 people that live in three different counties that include Johnsonville and a number of other cities. And so there's a, a big opportunity um, a, among uh, community choice entities where they have the opportunity, where in, in the states where they're allowed to, to aggregate multiple cities in order to uh, even increase even further their buying power. So those are kind of the, the basic things, uh, basic characteristics of any community choice program. The buying in the bulk, uh, the being able to do that and aggregate multiple cities, um, and it, the lower uh, salaries for executives and, and the access to cheaper public money. Ambitious community choice programs, on the other hand, are looking at leveraging a lot of different things. And this is really the core of the report's findings and what we're focused on is how are communities using this to push the envelope? What is it they're able to do if they really want to do more? Um, I want to start here with just talking about the Redwood Coast Energy Authority. So this is actually, uh, we'll be publishing a podcast interview I did with their executive director, director Matthew Marshall, next week on the Local Energy Rules podcast. So just want to flag that that's uh, upcoming. Um, but they're uh, up the coast a couple of hours from San Francisco. They're serving uh, a lot of um, rural or small cities, uh, coastal cities, uh, um, north of the Bay Area. And they're looking at a lot of different interesting things that they're doing uh, with this authority. So they're not just purchasing power and doing it at low cost and investing in renewable energy, like a lot of California community choice agencies or a lot of community choice agencies across the country. They're building a network of electric vehicle chargers along the coastal highway to uh, um, aid in uh, the transition to electric vehicles for customers of the community choice agency. They're partnering with the local forestry industry to use the scraps from the uh, biomass 
uh, to generate local renewable power from that industry. They're investigating uh, offshore wind as a way to uh, provide more uh, stable and, and new renewable energy resources. And they're also looking at um, uh, doing a microgrid at one of the local airports that would allow it to stay online, for example, during some of these public safety power shutoffs that have been impacting California customers because of wildfires. And so it's really this Redwood Coast in my mind, and there, there's a couple of other things in the report too in terms of that story, and you can hear it in the podcast interview as well, of they're just, they're thinking about this as a tool to advance a lot of different interests that they have in the community. You know, supporting uh, the economy that they have uh, in terms of other industries, uh, built, making resilient infrastructure uh, that can support them in ter terms of natural disaster, but also doing kind of traditional utility investments in, in more clean energy resources that are close to the community. So all of these kinds of things uh, are really powerful ways that Redwood Coast and other ambitious community choice agencies are looking to push further in what community choice can do. Um, and so this, this spans a lot of different things. So you see it with energy efficiency. So Marin Clean Energy, for example, uh, is the only so far community choice agency in California to take over energy efficiency program management from the utility company. Um, and they're doing a lot of the same things that the utility did, but on top of that doing, for example, you know, bonus rebates uh, above what the utility would typically offer. Uh, they're giving referral fees for folks who help uh, refer them to tenants um, that are interested in doing energy efficiency. They do no cost assessments, and then they do free direct installation of small measures uh, both for multifamily buildings and for single family residential buildings. So they're looking at how do they push a little bit further than traditional utility energy efficiency programs because they don't have an incentive to sell more power. There's no benefit to them in having more energy sales. Uh, it actually just increases their procurement cost. And so Marin Clean Energy is the first, but probably not for long going to be the only uh, community choice agency that looks to take more control over its energy efficiency program. Um, East Bay Community Energy is a really interesting case in the sense that um, it's not doing the, uh, um, it's not taking over the efficiency programming from the utility, but what they have done is aggregated energy use data, which they have access to now because they're supplying power, to provide to third parties who can provide energy efficiency services. And this is one of the big uh, kind of lock boxes uh, to unlock uh, that communities can uh, leverage in doing community choice. It's been very difficult across the country to get access to customer uh, energy use data that would allow for entrepreneurship and innovation and all sorts of things to take place in delivery of energy efficiency services. You know, helping to understand, for example, what time of day are people using energy? When, uh, you know, are there opportunities to better align people's energy use with time of use pricing? And so East Bay is really taking advantage of its uh, point in the system now, uh, of its position in the uh, electricity system to uh, leverage that data for um, uh, for more broad for broader use. Um, there's also renewable energy, and this is frankly this has been one of the sort of flagship pieces uh, or flagship elements of community choice programs has been making bigger investments in renewable energy than incumbent utilities. So um, this chart, uh, chart, which comes from a National Renewable Energy Laboratory on community choice, looks at um, the voluntary green power uh, purchases by community choice aggregation portfolios. So what you see is um, in the dark, the darkest color in the chart, uh, the bottom of the bars, that's power that is being purchased by community choice agencies that they are not required to under the state's uh, renewable energy mandate. So it's, it's going beyond that mandate. So you're seeing that in many different states, California, Illinois, Massachusetts, et cetera, uh, community choice agencies are buying more clean power than they're required to under state mandates, more than the incumbent, uh, in, in most cases, investor-owned utility uh, would be purchasing. Uh, we're also finding that there, um, make, many of these community choice programs are offering or require, uh, um, or, or even requiring or, or making the default 100% renewable energy. So over three quarters of California or Illinois or New York community choice programs have a 100% option where you can buy, opt up to a 100% renewable energy uh, supply, 100% renewable electricity supply. But in Illinois, Massachusetts, and Ohio, uh, a fair number of community choice programs are also requiring, are also making 100% the default and allowing people to opt down from that uh, rather than opting up. 
And of course, we know that from just the pure design of community choice programs in general, where the overall opt-out rates are on the order of 5% to 10%, that uh, making it the default makes it much more likely that customers will use it. And so these uh, uh, programs are significantly driving up the amount of clean energy purchases that they can then turn around and leverage in their negotiations in the market for more clean energy. Um, so I'm going to ask a question that's, a, that's pretty closely related, but not exactly here um, uh, to this, but it's around this notion of 100% energy. So Sierra Club has been running a Ready for 100 campaign and secured pledges from over 100 cities in the United States uh, that have um, uh, pledged to reach 100% renewable electricity at some date prior to 2050. And so this next and last poll that we have is how many cities that have either a community choice program or a municipal utility have already achieved a 100% renewable electricity goal. And I did see the comments finally after Jess had to walk down the hall and pointed out to me that I need to close the poll and share the results so it doesn't stick on your screen this time. So I'm, I am prepared to do that. So your uh, potential answers here are none. There are no cities that have achieved 100% renewable electricity. Uh, B, two cities, C, eight cities, 15 or 57 cities. So cities that have a community choice program or a municipal utility where 100% of the electricity comes from renewable resources. Three quarters of you have already voted, fabulous. We're good on early voting here. I'm still working on mail-in ballot technology, but I'll let you know. I'll give it maybe 10 more seconds here on the poll about how many cities that have achieved a 100% renewable electricity goal. Or 82%, the last poll, I think we got 91% responding. We've lost a couple of you. Somebody's on Buzzfeed. All right, very good. I'm going to close the poll. I'm going to share the results. So most folks think it's two, the plurality, and uh, sort of second place there is eight. It is eight cities. Um, you can see them on this map, which is included in the report. Um, uh, uh, really across the country, you've got both um, municipal utilities are the major uh, ones that are uh, achieving this goal, but also have uh, Glen Ellen, Illinois, uh, which for, I, I don't know if this is actually <laughs> still true. Uh, I'm pretty sure that it is uh, that we checked on this, but um, it was the only uh, community choice agency in Illinois to have 100% by default uh, in terms of the purchases they were making. Uh, someone did ask earlier about Illinois, and I think Illinois is, is really interesting. Their cities basically just sign very short-term contracts for power purchases. And so one of the reasons for the fluctuations in the number of cities that have participated is when the program first became available about five years ago, uh, wholesale power prices from the incumbent Commonwealth Edison were very high. And uh, because they had made some bad bets on the cost of uh, gas fired electricity, uh, you know, not anticipating the, the flood of uh, fracked gas. And so hundreds of cities piled on to sign two, you know, two year contracts to buy lower cost power. And then subsequently, uh, Commonwealth Edison renegotiated its gas contracts, their prices came down. And, and so there was no longer the headroom for cities to do 100% renewable as part of their purchases um, as they had to renew their contracts, but also no longer the uh, significant financial advantage. And very few Illinois cities uh, have really looked at how they can leverage beyond simply buying power on the open market and buying um, uh, renewable energy credits uh, more clean energy. And, and that has a lot to do, in fact, with the way that the contracting terms are established in state law and, and the, like, a, the length of time over which cities are able to sign those agreements. Uh, we have a little bit more on that in the report where we look at, in each state, how long they can um, sign contracts for for power. Um, Let's see here. <laughs> a lot of comments about what's going on in Texas. Uh, yes, I'm not going to get into the Georgetown, Texas thing. Folks should read up on that if they want. But uh, there are a couple things that uh, could probably be updated on this map. As you can see, it was last updated in August 2019. 
which is a reflection of how long it took me to publish this report. Um, so if you want to hear more about the story of one particular municipal utility that reached its 100% goal, we have a, a nice podcast interview with Muriel Weinberger um, and Darren uh, Springer. He's the, uh, the mayor and, and general manager of Burlington Electric, respectively, uh, that we just published a few weeks ago. Uh, and he talks more about how that local control was really important for them and being able to reach to 100% uh, renewable energy goal. And uh, in, in this case, they're talking about how they're trying to reach net zero uh, carbon emissions across their entire economy now that they've uh, reached that first goal. So we've talked about energy efficiency and now significantly about renewable energy as ways that community choice agencies are, are getting ambitious. I want to talk a little bit about local renewable energy. So. Um, uh, as an example here, Sonoma Clean Power has a local renewable energy product where you're buying your electricity from solar projects uh, locally during the day and from geothermal energy during the night from a, a geothermal electricity production facility that's uh, within the service territory of the Community Choice Agency. So this was a really important thing for them because they found when they were setting up the Community Choice Agency, when they were uh, talking to folks about what it was that they cared about getting energy nearby was was pretty important. And so they have a product uh, that is available. Uh, coming back to some data nationally available from uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab's report on voluntary green power sales, um, they actually looked at where that power comes from. So they don't get down to the level of local because local isn't really well defined. And there's some more conversation in that report actually of the challenge here of, you know, in some cases, a community choice entity is just the, the boundaries of the municipality in which there's not a lot of room to procure and generate renewable energy. In other cases, local means within, in the case of California, maybe a much broader service territory because it's an aggregation of cities and counties that's actually fairly significant. Like Sonoma Clean Power spans several counties north of the Bay Area and there's more available space then in which to generate energy locally within the service territory. Um, they note that uh, the, the NREL report basically breaks it down into national, regional, and then in-state, uh, because uh, in many cases, there's not a consistent definition of local. But you can see that there's a fairly significant interest in uh, community choice agencies and at least being able to advertise that the power that they're buying is coming from within the state uh, where that community choice agency is located. Um, and of course, when we get to things like jobs and economic development, as we'll talk about now, that's one of the reasons why community choice agencies are thinking about this is what is it, what's the um, added economic benefit that we can look to if we're able to both buy power ourselves, but to procure it from local sources where then the economic benefits may accrue uh, to our community. So uh, um, East Bay Community Energy actually ha is, um, uh, I think one of the more interesting uh, examples here where they have created a, as part of the Community Choice Agency, a local development business plan, which specifically calls for money to be set aside from the agency to do more economic development to figure out how to uh, develop jobs and workforce that will provide the clean energy resources for the community. Um, <clears throat> we actually just published a podcast interview with Jessica Tovar. She's the, uh, an organizer with the East Bay Clean Power Alliance, which was um, a lot of the sort of public uh, pressure for the community choice agency to form. And she talks about uh, this local development business plan and, and what were some of the aims of the community in, in creating that. Uh, the East Bay uh, Community Energy uh, program serves Oakland, California, Alameda County, uh, and some of the surrounding area. Um, we've also seen a really strong focus among community choice agencies uh, in uh, talking about union labor as, as a part of their uh, value added economically. So this chart actually comes from CalCCA, which is the um, umbrella uh, organization of uh, community choice agencies in California. It's like their trade group and their lobbying arm. So they're actually aggregating power now on a different level, which is in, in the political sphere. And it highlights how uh, of projects that community choice agencies are procuring power from where they're using uh, union labor uh, as a part of that. And this was actually an early critique of uh, community choice programs was that they weren't enough focused on this. There was, a, I can't remember, there was a particular project that we talk about in the report where uh, union council actually sent a letter formally to the community choice agency, letting them know that they were disappointed that there wasn't more investment and focus on union labor. Uh, clearly the message has been received and there's been a significant investment uh, by community choice agencies now in, in doing union jobs and union labor in their uh, clean energy uh, developments. 
And finally, what we see are seeing with ambitious community choice agencies, you know, we're seeing them focus on a lot of things within the energy sphere, you know, energy efficiency, uh, renewable energy, electric vehicles, which I didn't actually mention, uh, you know, jobs and economic development, but also community governance. So there are actually eight California community choice entities that have community advisory councils. So a specific body of folks that re are representative of the community in some way, sometimes it targets uh, specific uh, classes of people like communities of color. Uh, sometimes it's like a faith leader and, and maybe some, uh, or maybe it's geographic uh, within the community that they want, you know, one representative from each of the communities that they serve. But these community advisory councils are intended to help keep the community choice agency true to the interests of the community, as well as its broader focus on procuring cost effective uh, and affordable power for its customers. So what's coming up next for community choice? Um, it's been growing. Uh, a couple of states, uh, New Hampshire most recently, were added to the list of states that allow for community choice. We're seeing growth in the states that have had these policies on the books, even if it's been for a long time that they've been around, and now we're seeing a lot of growth. Um, this map, which uh, um, comes from Lean Energy US, looks at even just the growth in California, uh, some of the anticipated growth in some of the other cities that are investigating. Um, I mentioned earlier that it was as many as 12 million more customers that would be added. I think it was actually just in the last couple of months that San Diego indicated that it was going to move ahead with um, a community choice uh, program uh, after a long consideration of that. We actually have, um, it's uh, mentioned on there as the cities and county under investigation, but uh, we did an interview with uh, a couple of folks from there for the podcast one a number of, about four or five years ago as they were thinking about how they would reach some of the clean energy goals the community had set up. And then I did another one with their um, director of sustainability uh, about um, where they were at in terms of trying to reach their goals and their negotiations with the incumbent investor-owned utility uh, around 100% renewable electricity. Uh, so there's a lot more there to dig into if you're interested uh, around California, but it's not just there uh, that we're seeing growth. As I mentioned before, in New York and Massachusetts and in other states, the other thing that's happening, and I'm not going to be able to explain all of this graphic, but it comes from a, a post by Samuel Golding, who is a community choice expert who works out in California uh, with a group called Community Choice Partners. What I think is really important here is that he highlights sort of this evolution in how community choice agencies are um, in becoming more sophisticated. So without getting into too much of the details, and I would say if you want to find more information from him, check out his LinkedIn page. That's where I grabbed this from. Uh, after getting his permission. Um, but this is kind of where this notion of like modest versus ambitious community choice agencies came from for the report, is this notion that as these agencies have developed, they've gone from an entity that essentially says, you know, we're a, an aggregating retailer that buys electricity. Um, now they're creating these new power agencies that often work across multiple municipalities. Now their operations are involved, evolving because they have more ability to specialize. And as he, he calls here the sort of the 3.0 of community choice energy as a super agency, which is creating a joint action agency to coordinate together. Uh, and this is actually kind of in some ways similar to what you've seen, for example, with rural electric cooperatives, where um, you know, when they started out, they were uh, unique to each uh, geographic territory that the distribution cooperative uh, worked within but they eventually started to band together to get economies of scale and the things that they were doing, whether that was to procure more power uh, or to share knowledge about operations or all these kind of things. So there's a whole lot here. The slideshow will be shared if you want to read it in greater detail. But the idea is as, as community choice grows and gets more, uh, it will also get more sophisticated and it will allow local governments to uh, really dig into a lot of different ways that community choice can uh, tap into other uh, public goods that uh, governments are trying to reach. Um, so I showed this chart before um, of where community choice is now. There are actually, there you can see that there's a number of states that have deregulated electricity markets where a community choice uh, has um, has or could be on the table, whether it's Maine, Michigan, Oregon, Pennsylvania, or Maryland, or Texas. So lots of different places where community choice would be a good option. And would not, and would probably also be relatively uh, a, a relatively smaller political lift. Um, and then you have all these blue states uh, where uh, utilities are um, still regulated and monopolies, but where a lot of customers are looking for choice. And we cover this a lot in our Voices of 100% podcast series. 
where we talk with folks from cities that have made 100% commitments about the struggle that they have to reach those commitments. And that's one of the things that they're facing is, unless you're a municipal utility in one of these blue states, you may not have the flexibility to choose where the power supply comes from. It may be hard to reach that goal. So I just wanna thank you for listening, for participating in this webinar, for your interest in this report. I'm gonna go back now and look at the questions on the control panel here and see if I can answer some of them, address some of the comments and things that came up uh, during the presentation. Uh, you can still add more questions, uh, throw stuff at me in the chat box, uh, and we'll see if we can um, uh, get to most of your questions here before the top of the hour. So there were a lot of comments just saying they could see the screen. Thank you. Um, I had a question from Melissa here earlier about how long does a choice program last? Um, I did cover this. Uh, I think I caught this question earlier, but just wanted to uh, repeat that uh, we do talk in the report. There's in the appendix a list of the information that we found about contract length in each of the states that allow for community choice. And places like Illinois have, by law, re really short contract periods. And so that has heavily restricted how much Illinois has been able to do in terms of uh, exercising uh, more flexibility and more power uh, in their community choice programs. Um, another question here about what level of participation we see from low-income customers in community choice energy adoption. Uh, this kind of gets at that, that slide I had with the four arrows on it on the choices that customers get, but um, it, uh, the, because most, uh, or sorry, because all community choice programs are using their, um, uh, uh, the opt-out method, everybody is automatically part of the choice program. Uh, I think what your question might be getting at and what I actually don't have a good answer to is how are community choice programs serving low-income customers? I do know that that is a focus, for example, in the East Bay Community Energy Program, and that's part of the goal of their local business, the local development business plan is to figure out how do we help low-income customers by, for example, getting them to be part of the workforce or making sure that the energy efficiency programs are targeting them first. Um, but all of them are automatically enrolled. And in the case of say California, or uh, just cause I'm more familiar with that one, the um, low income rates that are available for low income customers under investor owned utilities are also available to customers in community choice. So um, it's a, it's a, Low income customers are a focus of specifically of some community choice agencies, but, all, uh, but not necessarily in others, but almost all of them get enrolled automatically. Um, there were a few comments when I was doing the 100% map of 100% uh, uh, cities uh, that have um, municipal or community choice programs. Um, Georgetown, Texas is of course really interesting. So I did an interview with their mayor uh, a couple of years ago and he was very proud of the fact that they had signed contracts to get 100% of their electricity on an annual basis from wind and solar. Um, the comment that was offered here, I think gets to the point where, um, unfortunately, the, the power contracts are now at a premium uh, more significantly than they were at the time that they were signed. And so it has been a little bit of a financial boondoggle um, one thing I've heard the mayor say in response that I think is important and I've heard from other community choice agencies is that the um, power costs that they've secured are at least very stable over the long term. So they might be more expensive now, but they are uh, offering some stability in the rates over long term period, uh, which I think is a potential advantage of municipal utilities in particular in, in terms of being able to do long term procurement. Um, anyway, I don't want to get too much into that because we're not even talking about a community choice agency, but it is uh, definitely a sort of asterisk on the map of 100% cities. Um, so that's another comment about Denton, Texas, which is another municipal utility that's been getting pursuing 100%, um, but they do have uh, a gas plant um, there as well. Uh, it was mentioned here. Um, Let's see here, uh, New Jersey uh, mentioned here that the Sustainable Essex Alliance is a five town community choice aggregation program. Um, so not displayed in the chart. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Russell for mentioning that. We'll, we'll make sure that we have that on our updated map. As I mentioned, this report was a long time in developing. So I apologize if a couple of the maps as was reflected in the dates, uh, didn't capture that. The last time I had checked, I couldn't find a record on New Jersey. So thank you very much for mentioning that. Um, let's see here, community solar gardens compared to uh, community choice aggregation. 
this is a good question, but I think is uh, kind of apples to oranges a little bit. Community solar gardens are kind of one-off, typically, projects for generating renewable energy that can either be owned or at least subscribed to by individual customers. Um, a community choice agency could use community solar, uh, community-owned solar or community-subscribed solar to meet some of their procurement goals. Um, but usually a community choice agency is simply saying, we need to buy X number of kilowatt hours and we're gonna think about where that energy should come from. And then, so you have, for example, Marin Clean Energy saying, well, we're gonna have a feed-in tariff to buy solar energy from local sources. So it's for power produced specifically within our service territory, but it doesn't usually get down into that uh, issue around ownership and like, like around community solar. So it's a little bit different in the sense that community choice agencies work a lot like utilities in terms of how they think of power procurement um, for the most part, whereas community solar gardens are often, uh, you know, maybe they're enabled by a specific policy uh, to be developed in, uh, in a state or within a particular utility service territory, um, but they are a little bit more um, complex. So I don't think I'm fully answering that question. We do have a pretty good report uh, in 2016 on community renewable energy where I kind of get into the details there, um, uh, but they, they are sort of different things. Um, oh, good question here uh, from someone who's working on the city of Boston's community choice energy program um, and, and looking at kind of curious about how to engage the community members in program design and implementation. I would definitely recommend and be happy to put you in touch with Jessica Tovar from East Bay, um, uh, the Clean Power Alliance there. They, there was a very significant effort among community members there to do engagement and to ensure, for example, that there was a community advisory committee that would be in, in that uh, structure. So I think that's a um, really good example of someone that you could talk to about that. And Aiden, I'd be happy to put you in touch. So if you want to follow up and email me, um, that's Jay Farrell at ILSR.org. Uh, happy to help uh, make that connection if that's useful. Um, another question here about Arcadia Power. Um, Arcadia Power is pretty different. My understanding is that they sort of work as a billing intermediary. So in a lot of states, you can designate someone else to be responsible for paying your bill. And it, in some ways, is a legacy of when utilities didn't have automatic bill payment, or maybe people like just like to have a bill payment service that was independent that they'd use to pay a lot of bills. And so there's an interface there that allows them to basically bill you for renewable energy credits at the same time you buy power from the utility and because they're your billing interface. Um, it's, I think it's pretty different from community choice en energy in the sense that it's not, it's not geographically tied to anything and it's not tied to a public agency or a, you know, a municipality. It's just Arcadia Power customers. So yes, they are aggregating customers. Uh, and so that's good. They're getting some buying power. And yes, you can have a choice because you can choose them as your billing agent, but it's not the same kind of geographic aggregation that Community Choice is offering. Um, thank you for the person watching from Alberta, um, New York. Let's see here. How Community Choice programs are funded. Um, they. Uh, I guess the short answer here in terms of how community choice programs are funded is that they're funded by the sales of electricity to ultimate customers. So if you go back to one of those earlier graphics I had about kind of how the CCA fits into the mix where you had the CCA and then the incumbent utility and then the customer, the community choice agency is just replacing the function that the uh, usual utility is for buying power. So they're gonna buy power at wholesale rates and they're gonna sell it at a retail rate, uh, if you will. Um, it doesn't have the same markup as an incumbent utility because they don't own the poles and wires and don't have to do that maintenance, but that's how they pay for the services. So uh, community choice agencies can do all sorts of creative things with their rate structure. They can use time of use pricing. They can raise or lower rates for different folks uh, just as utilities can decide, but that's how they pay for their services. Um, Oh, good question about Redwood Coast building out its network of EV chargers and about where the benefits go uh, and can it spend money to benefit non-community choice customers. I think this is where you get one of those really interesting intersections here between public agencies. So you have a community choice uh, entity that also is owned by 
uh, or is run by all the cities and counties that it serves. And so I'm sure there are some specific rules about where the money goes and how it can cross lines there, but, uh, and I don't know enough about the specifics of that Redwood Coast program to answer your question specifically, but I would suspect that there is some flexibility there in the same way that, for example, in Minnesota, you have an investor-owned utility monopoly that's spending money on doing EV charging infrastructure uh, that are public chargers. Uh, that may benefit non-utility customers who, for example, might drive in from somewhere else. So uh, I don't think a CCA is unique in having to deal with some of those challenges, but it is unique in the fact that some of the same entities that care about EV charging structure, maybe from a public service standpoint, also own the utility company. Um, got an offline question here. Uh, do we have a model for a statute for instituting community choice in regulated states? Um, I, California to me is the model of community choice uh, policy and I do have, if you look at our recent community power scorecard, where we score states based on the policies they have for allowing local flexibility around energy, um, I, there is a link to our uh, model policy guide and that includes the exact statutory language from California along with some annotations that I added about how that might differ from state to state. Um, I, I don't think, uh, I mean, Frankly, you're gonna need somebody uh, from a legislative research office to help you write legislation in any state because you need to know where the existing statutes are about, for example, municipalization or utility service territories. So it gets pretty weedy, um, but the California model is available on our website. Um, I think this will probably be the last question I'm able to take, but I we just want to offer that for the questions I don't get to here, um, we will publish a follow-up on our webinar page where I'll publish answers to all of the questions here. Um, and the last one here is about the small percentage of customers that opt out of a community choice program and whether that goes up if the percentage of renewable energy is higher. Um, I, I, I think it's probably not, I think as you're alluding to here uh, in the question, it's not really the amount of renewable energy that motivates people to opt out, it's the price. <laughs> Uh, and so as long as it's competitive, we see people sticking with the default. Um, usually what I've seen is that the 100% options or even like the local 100% options are gonna cost people up to about 10% more per month and usually less than that. It's the, I think the 10% one was for one of the local renewable energy products as opposed to uh, just 100% renewable products. So the dollar amounts we're talking about are pretty small. Um, and what they've found is that opt-out rates don't significantly increase for that amount of money. Um, certainly that could be an issue, but it's, um, uh, and, and one that the CCA has to deal with, but you know, it, it's an operational risk for any utility. And, and for example, uh, one of the things that I think is fascinating that's going on right now in California is that as part of the rise of community choice, we're now seeing the incumbent investor-owned utilities offer also offer choice. So like Pacific Gas and Electric has a solar choice program where you can get 100% of your electricity from solar, uh, just like the community choice programs have something similar. Uh, and it's and the two are cost competitive. I think the comparison I saw from Sonoma Clean Power on their website was that you know the 100% products for the community choice agency and the incumbent utility are pretty similar, and they both cost some you know on the uh, in the ballpark of 3% more per month. So I'm sorry I can't get to all the questions uh, in the time that we have available, but like I said, uh, we will publish this webinar video on our website and also publish the questions and answers. And so for the ones I wasn't able to get to online, I'll be happy to, to come back and uh, type in some answers and put in some links, uh, which actually hopefully will be useful then for some of these where I've already mentioned some other resources that we can pop those in on the webpage. But uh, thanks again for joining us. Uh, enjoy the report, it's available freely on our website. Um, and check out the podcast too, where we've got a lot of stories uh, about communities that have done this, uh, made this effort around community choice. Take care.